Please give a warm round of applause to Axios senior space reporter, Miriam Kramer. Uh, our next guest is somebody who I have spoken with quite a few times over the years, and I am so excited today to talk to him about what's next in space and beyond, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yes, indeed. Ah, so, Bill. Um, Earlier today, Mark Kelly mentioned to us that he thinks we're going to see people on Mars in 20 years. You think you can beat it? Uh, maybe in uh, 18 years. Hey. <laughs> I'm saying 2040. 2040, okay. Uh, and obviously, a lot of that is dependent on the <clears throat> Artemis mission. Uh, the Artemis program, and I, I feel like Monday, right, we're getting a big announcement about the first crewed Artemis program, um, the cr first crewed Artemis mission, uh, and who's going to be flying on it. Can you give us any details? What can you tell us about that announcement Monday? That we're going to make the announcement. <laughs> oh, come on. You don't want to break some news, Bill? <laughs> 10 o'clock uh, Houston time, Monday. <laughs> okay. What do we know about the crew makeup right now? Anything you well, can tell we us? do know that it will be an international crew. It will be three Americans and one Canadian. Okay. What are you most looking forward to with that mission? It's not landing on the moon, right? We're going around the moon and coming back. But what, what are you going to be looking at? This is the testing of the human uh, support systems. We've already tested the rocket and the spacecraft. Uh, that was a 26-day mission uh, last November, and it passed all the tests. It was so good that uh, we added additional tests during the course of the flight. Um, and so now we're going to put a human crew on it, uh, check it out. it be the first time that we've been back to the moon in a half century. And then about a year after that, mm -hmm. we go into lunar polar elliptical orbit. And of the four, two will then transfer into the SpaceX lander, mm -hmm. uh, land, be a six-day mission on the surface, and that will be the first woman and the next man that will walk on the moon. Yeah. So... Artemis three, that lunar landing. What? I mean, is 2025 still looking good? Are you, are you saying like it's 2025 or bust at this point? You know, space is hard. And, and you also have to wait until you know that it's as safe as possible because you're living right on the edge yeah. every time we uh, launch in a very unforgiving atmosphere uh, into a very hostile environment. Uh, so uh, I'm not so concerned with the time as we're not going to launch until it's right. Yeah. And that's what we did with this last one. Uh, it was supposed to go in August. We went through a couple of things. By the way, we went through two hurricanes yeah. <laughs> hitting directly on the Kennedy mm -hmm. Space Center. One of them hit the rocket. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> it did. And uh, we launched when it was right. Uh, that's what we're going to do with, especially when you put a crew up on top. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned SpaceX. Like, SpaceX is one of NASA's most important contractors. You guys are one of their most important customers. How is the relationship with SpaceX these days? Uh, it's been excellent. Yeah. Uh, who would have thunk? Years ago, Boeing and SpaceX were competing for commercial crew to orbit. This was as a result of the legislation that uh, Kay Bailey Hutchinson of Texas and I passed 13 years ago that said we're going in a different direction. It's going to involve commercial uh, partners. Yeah. 
instead of it being just U.S. government. And so commercial crew, commercial cargo to the International Space Station, low Earth orbit. And who would have thunk? Uh, a competition between Boeing and SpaceX. SpaceX, uh, although they had had some success, they were basically a startup. Yep. And here now, SpaceX, uh, we just sent uh, a crew uh, number six up to the station. Uh, and uh, Boeing uh, has just had some problems. They will be successful. Yeah. And we'll get that uh, going with crew so that we'll have a second uh, uh, vehicle in which to get to and from the space tax. Yeah. So I want to talk about Elon Musk a little bit. Um, his comments have increasingly become, in many ways, politically polarizing. Like, I, I think that generally folks look at Elon and say, like, okay, he used to be a pretty, like, straight-ahead guy, and now he's sort of, like, being pretty partisan with what he says about uh, many different topics. And I wonder, as NASA administrator, if that can put you in a difficult position, because in many ways, that can politicize his companies. And when you have SpaceX as such an important contractor, you want that to appeal to a wide breadth of people, I would imagine. And he's increasingly not doing that as the head of that company. So I guess, what, what do you have to say about it? Like, <laughs> what, what is, uh, well, is it hard for you? You don't mean to say that Elon is controversial. <laughs> no. Uh, so I can answer your question this way. Uh, I ran into uh, Gwen Shotwell in December, and I said with a twinkle in my eye, uh, tell me that I don't have to worry about SpaceX with all of the activity going on with Twitter. And she said, you don't have to worry. Gwen Shotwell, the president, runs SpaceX. Elon Musk has a great deal of trust and confidence in her. And look at the results. It's been phenomenal. The Falcon 9 rocket has now become the workhorse for not only the U.S. government, including defense and intelligence, as well as NASA, but also the commercial sector. Uh, and, um, and so there's been phenomenal success there. Now, it's true, that's low Earth orbit. Going to the moon is a different thing. Yeah. And uh, so it's, uh, it's another adventure, but yeah. uh, we are very confident, and I keep asking every day, uh, tell me the progress. And yeah. they're saying that SpaceX is making all the milestones Okay, uh, and that's for Starship. As, as we, that's for the lander. Okay. That's correct, uh, okay. the lunar lander. Yeah. I mean, how important is it to see Starship go orbital next month? I mean, that's, that's what they're aiming for. Like, that's essential to the, the Artemis three landing. So what? Well, yeah. <laughs> before you fly, you have to test. <laughs> And uh, then you have to test it on all different aspects. Uh, you have to test also on your ability to come back into the Earth's atmosphere. That was what was so critical about the Artemis One. The one test that you cannot replicate on Earth is the heat shield coming in on the fiery heat of reentry, uh, yeah. coming in at Mach 32 back from the moon, 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You can't uh, simulate that on Earth. So you have to do it. But that's part of what space flight is, and space is hard. Um, so talking about the moon a little bit more, um, NASA is not the only agency aiming to land people on the moon, obviously. China and Russia have uh, signed on together to uh, create a, a research station on the moon. I am really fascinated sort of by the geopolitical lines that are being redrawn, especially as the International Space Station comes to a close. Like, 
What are you watching there? What is most interesting to you about China's posture in space? And, and what are you going to be looking for? Well, first of all, look at Russia. Uh, here, uh, incredibly difficult situation politically with uh, Putin's uh, inexcusable, uh, just savaging of uh, the Ukrainian people in the Ukrainian land. Um, and yet, we've had that kind of tense relationship with going back to the Soviet Union. And in the midst of the Soviet Union Cold War, an American spacecraft and a Soviet spacecraft rendezvoused and docked in space in 1975. And that started uh, a friendly uh, cooperation between those two countries, and it's continued ever since. And we don't miss a beat on the International Space Station now between our cosmonauts and our astronauts. And it takes both of us to operate the station because we built the space station together. So look at that. Yeah. That's uh, an incredible irony in politics that you can have that kind of relationship when your politics on the face of the earth differ so much. Yeah. By the way, that carries through to our activities, space activities with Russia at Moscow uh, Mission Control and Houston Mission yeah. Control. And now we fly an American astronaut with a Russian crew and we fly a Russian astronaut with the American crew. Right. All right, preparatory to answering your question on China. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Zip. It's nothing. China uh, just simply is not cooperative, nor are they transparent. They are very secret. And as a result, you have what you have, so that they're very good. Yeah. And in the last 10 years, uh, they've exceptionally uh, come forward with a lot of progress. Yeah. Uh, so they put up three elements of their space station, for example. And each time in their booster rocket, they did not reserve enough fuel in order to have a controlled reentry and therefore it comes tumbling back through the atmosphere and they don't share the coordinates, they don't share the information. On the second time that they did it, we thought it was going into Greece yeah. and then into Saudi Arabia. Thank goodness it went into the Indian Ocean. Yeah, I, do you see any path there toward cooperation? I mean, there are even congressional roadblocks like the Wolf Amendment, we've talked about that before, that basically just gives you another layer of bureaucracy that NASA has to go over to get congressional approval to even do anything with China in many ways. And I, I, it, it feels like there are roadblocks on both sides. Years ago, I hosted the first Chinese Taikonaut. Mm. That's their astronaut. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I introduced him to Buzz Aldrin <laughs> when he came to see me in the Senate. Uh, but we just have not had that uh, extension of friendship. So, uh, for example, about a year ago, I ran into the Chinese ambassador here at a Sunday morning brunch. And uh, I, I said, he, in the conversation, he says, uh, well, what can we do to talk? And I said, uh, well, uh, we're happy to do that. Uh, and I'll give you an example of something yeah. that you can do. Uh, you just returned samples from the moon. Mm -hmm. We returned samples from the moon half a century ago. We made it available to the international community. Yeah. You can make that available. A year later, nothing. Yeah. That's interesting. I, <coughs> I wonder if there... If there is anything, I, I guess about the moon specifically, like it's, there's about to be a fair bit of traffic <laughs> going to and from the moon, satellites in orbit, lots of stuff, like a lot of dust being kicked up. I, is, are there lines of communication open to discuss that kind of thing? Just the, the coordination of when you're launching, when you're not launching. Good point. Uh, we have had some deconfliction mm with China with regard to the Mars rover. 
Uh, uh, with regard to the Mars uh, uh, orbiter. Okay. Uh, but that seems to be the only that we've had. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so one other piece of China news that has made a lot of headlines recently, obviously, was the balloon, <laughs> um, the surveillance balloon that was over the US. Uh, where does NASA's jurisdiction end? <laughs> um, by the way, I finally told them after you'd had all those other balloons, uh -huh. I said, please call them balloons. Don't call them UAPs. Oh, boy. That causes <laughs> That's a, everybody to start thinking, are there aliens <laughs> out there and so forth. Uh, so I, I can tell you what's been reported in the press. Uh, General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, called me and said, uh, we've got this uh, Chinese balloon that's about to come into our territory, and we need to know uh, from your balloon experts about debris patterns and what would happen when you shoot it down, uh, where is it going to land, because we want to avoid people and property, and we also want to recover the instrument. And the instrument was a big instrument. Yeah, it looked like a satellite. It looked like it was a satellite hanging down from big, that big, balloon. Big, big, big. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Um, so, yeah. so we put them with our balloon experts, and yeah. uh, they have since been very grateful uh, because our balloon experts know what they're doing. I bet. <laughs> I ju just returned from seeing our experts where they launch in the southern hemisphere mm -hmm. from uh, New Zealand. And uh, it's amazing, these payloads that these balloons go up to 120,000 yeah. feet, and then they reside there, and the winds carry them. And these payloads are the size of a truck. <laughs> our balloons, of course, are scientific instruments yeah. that are <laughs> observing <laughs> up there and well, NASA's are, yeah. what's happening on the Earth. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned UAPs, <laughs> so I'm taking the opening. Um, NASA decided to do a study about uh, UAPs, about public information, make everything available to the public. Where do we stand on that study? What are things looking like these days? Uh, I'll refrain from asking if we're alone, um, <laughs> but UAPs. <laughs> um, and you want to know when the aliens are going to arrive? Yeah, just like a, like a general date would be great. <laughs> um, first of all, NASA has as its mission to look for life. Mm -hmm. That's statutory. Uh, that's why we are digging on Mars right now in our rover. And we will return those samples in 2031. And we'll see on that dry lake bed was there a sign of life. Uh, there are phenomena out there that uh, those Navy pilots know that they saw something. You've seen it on TV. Mm -hmm. And so what I decided was, well, we ought to look at this from a scientific point of view, not from a military point of view. Uh, and that's what we've convened, is this panel of uh, about a dozen and a half uh, really uh, credentialed scientists to look at it maybe to look at some of our sensors. Mm -hmm. What have our sensors that are Earth observing with regard to climate? And by the way, we are a climate yeah. agency. Most people don't realize NASA is a climate agency. Uh, to see if some of our sensors might have picked up information that would give us, and that panel is gonna report this summer. Okay. Well, I think that's about all we have time for, but thank you so much, Bill, for doing this. Yeah, I appreciate thanks. it. It's yeah. a pleasure. Thanks.